geeks and geekettes, ladies and gentlemen, senors and senoritas, mein Damen and mein Herren, comic book fans all around the world, welcome back again to Ask Chuck Dixon, where you get to ask me, a world-famous, world-renowned, world-celebrated comic book writer. And you get to ask me about what I do for a living, and what I do for a living is I write comic books. Let's get to our first question. Human action. Monster 45 gets a shout out in this episode, this previous episode. Have Larry and Chuck ever worked together or would you consider it? I would like to see Larry write something for Ripperverse. And we're talking about Larry Correa. Uh, Larry Correa, best-selling novelist, raconteur, and uh, uh, master marksman, I would assume. He better be good with all those guns he owns. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't know if Larry has any... Uh, desire to write comic books, uh, being that he's so successful at being a novelist, uh, wildly successful, huge fan base. Um, and I, I, I much admire this man. Um, now he and I were in talks with a publisher, oh boy, like 10 years ago about adapting his monster hunter books into graphic novels, but that never went anywhere because, um, I don't think the publisher was thrilled, uh, <laughs> with working with a pair of notorious conservative uh, gun nuts. So, uh, but, you know, uh, I like Larry a lot. I like what he does. As I said, I admire uh, his career, certainly. And uh, I did make him a G.I. Joe character. He is spreadsheet in my run on G.I. Joe. He's the accountant, because that's what Larry does for a living when he's not writing about monster hunters and high fantasy and um, when I asked Larry for pictures, he said, ah, just tell the artist to draw a more friendly James Gandolfini, which I think is an accurate description of the man. Ah, uh, okay, let's move on to the next question. Daniel, Daryl Herrick has a bit of a uh, treatise here, more than a question. <laughs> and uh, so, so sit back while I read Mr. Herrick's uh, very thoughtful, very insightful an in-depth analysis of a uh, previous answer I gave here. If I may riff a bit off your mention on your podcast that the slick magazine you found in Publix about the history of the Batman made little mention of the Batman comic book, my thought was, why should it? It's not as if the buyer of that magazine is going to find a Batman comic book at the same Publix. Indeed, I could argue that it should not carry many references to the comic books. If someone in his or her 40s... <clears throat> casually says he or she is a Marvel fan, that person is likely talking about the movies. Now that Stan Lee is no longer lingering on longer than Aunt May, Disney might be wise to disassociate the characters altogether from the source material. While many magazines have more recently transitioned to be mostly online, comic books made their transition in the 1980s when they moved to direct market. Is the adolescent who leads to a copy of that Batman retrospective going to pedal his bike to the comic book shop five or ten miles away? Or will the adult, who might be comfortable paying ten dollars to see a superhero movie at the movie theater, feel equally as comfortable walking into the comic book shop? Harry Donenfeld and Jack Leibowitz's spicy pulp magazines used to be sold as under-the-counter magazines at the local newsstand. But now DC Comics comic books are more out of sight than were the company's earlier products. Still, the argument can be made that any gain in comic book sales is a net gain, but I could argue that it's not a gain for the larger corporation. Most people age out of comic book reading, and to promote the connection between comic book and film also promotes the idea that people will age out of superhero films. Moreover, can comic books generate market-tested ideas for other media when the market is so small and specialized i i have a problem with a lot of what you said <laughs> um no i would not expect someone to see a reference in one of these um you know time books or people magazines that specialize you know like the, you know, the secrets of spider-man the life of batman you know the story of superman I, I would not expect them just because there was a sample comic book inside of that magazine I, I wouldn't expect even a large majority, even a considerable majority of them, to suddenly want to seek out the comics. But that doesn't mean you couldn't capture some of the audience for that magazine. At least make them aware of it. Um, there's lots of ways, you know, obviously at Publix or 
Walgreens or wherever you might find your magazines um, or Barnes and Noble. Well, Barnes and Noble, there are comics there. Anyway, um, they're not going to find a comic book nearby. They're not going to go, oh, this comic looks really cool. I'll pick up that Batman comic next to it. And there's not going to be a Batman comic next to it. There are other ways. I mean, there are QR, QR codes. Take your phone. Takes you directly to a free Batman or Superman or Spider-Man comic book. You can read it right there on your phone if you, if you are so inclined. That's not pedaling your bike five to ten miles. I also argue how many kids pedal their bike anywhere these days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe maybe virtually. Um, so I, I argue with you there that that they they. There should be, okay, my other argument, and I have two more against what you said, is um, that the, um, the, the corporations have no interest in promoting the comic book end of the source material that they're making billions of dollars off of. Well, in the long run, they should. They should acknowledge where this material came from. It's kind of the charm of it, isn't it, that we know where it came from? If you ever see a Sherlock Holmes movie, um, w wouldn't it add to your enjoyment to know that these stories are have a legacy? They have a provenance? You know, that, that Sherlock Holmes wasn't just created for the movie you are currently watching? That there's a history? I mean, okay, maybe most people aren't. But, you know, who cares about that? Uh, I'm talking about the people who are curious, culturally curious. Uh, you know, um, have a literary curiosity, just, you know, want to know more about the history of what they're watching. Um, and, and those are the kind of people that read comic books. Those are nerds. Those are geeks. It's the audience for comic books. Those are the people you want. And I would argue that, um, yeah, the corporation should have an interest. But even if they don't have an interest, once upon a time, DC was owned by Warner, you know, still is owned by Warner. But once upon a time, when Warner owned uh, DC Comics, it was run by people who jealously guarded the DC Comics brand. They just didn't roll over for their corporate overlords. They just didn't stay quiet at the meetings. They, they advocated for the comic book companies, and they advocated for um, creator rights and things like that. I'm talking about Jeanette Kahn and uh, Paul Levitz. Um, they were advocates. They were guardians. They were stewards of a brand. And they took their jobs very, very seriously. And they stood up to a lot of the things that Warners would want to do. Uh, uh, even when they were wrong, at least they were standing up for it. And so, but you don't have that anymore. There's nobody at Marvel or DC who's going to challenge their masters. Uh, they're going to, well, I mean, DC was basically told to move out of their own offices. So that's how far that they got that, that got them. I put forward to you that if Jeanette Kahn and Paul Levitz were in charge of DC Comics today, they would not have left those offices. They would have fought to stay. They would have fought for their place within the parent company that they're in. But Warners and Disney routinely um, either ignores, exploits, uses, violates, molests, and otherwise uh, treats poorly uh, the people running the comic book divisions. Uh, they treat them like you know third-class citizens, like serfs, like slaves, like the uh, the dust beneath their chariot wheels, and um, that would not have happened back in the day, and it shouldn't happen now. Uh, but I will say, you know, uh, Paul Levitz, a lot of times they would do these kind of magazines, and there would be no comics in them, so he wasn't pushing there either. Uh, I think Jeanette would have. I think Jeanette would have pushed for comics. Um, I had a third argument, and now it's escaping me. <laughs> let me let me review. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I can't remember my third argument, but but <laughs> it's uh, largely that there are different ways to get people engaged with the comics. You certainly shouldn't miss an opportunity. In a 100-page magazine, why not have five pages of comics? Uh, it'll engage somebody and at least acknowledge the history. So um, that's my argument. Also, I think there should be uh, comics on the rack 
next to those magazines. I think it should be formatted like those magazines at a length uh, and price point close to what those magazines are. So that if there is a, uh, a magazine about the life of Superman, there should be a comic book next to it formatted much like uh, Japanese manga collections. Uh, the, those telephone book size comics they do are done. And I think this would be a winner. I think that kids would pick them up, uh, young adults would pick them up, uh, nostalgic adults who remember reading comic books once upon a time would pick them up if they were available. This is the problem, They're not available. So maybe I'll remember my third argument before this is over. Ron Young, the Folio Society has put out a Batman collection of the 85th anniversary. It has 12 adventures selected by Jeanette Kahn. There's Jeanette again. Though they're only listing 11 of them. Do you approve the picks? What would you have chosen had it been your task and been restricted to 12 items? I read the list and uh, I'm, I'm really wondering what the 12th one is. Uh, but um, two that I would put on there if I was making my own list absolutely would have to be there would be uh, The Strange Costumes of the Batman, which uh, has been a big influence on me. It was my absolute favorite Batman story when I was a kid. And I like it because it's, it's Batman-centric, but it's also very Robin-centric. It's one of the rare early Batman stories where Robin actually plays a huge pivotal role, more so than just being the sidekick. And of course, a few weeks ago, I mentioned Night of the Stalker from uh, Archie Goodwin's uh, editorial run on, on Detective Comics, a story um, that is just, uh, to me, it is the ultimate Batman story. It boils Batman down to his very, very essence. It's a story in which he, he, he has no dialogue, and yet we see his toughness, his resourcefulness, his abilities as a detective, everything in a very, very simple story about a robbery in Gotham City goes horribly, horribly wrong, and the terrifying um, uh, consequences for the robbers because Batman is not going to give up until he's brought them all to justice. And um, I would include those. I saw the list, and I think Jeanette was looking at it from a publisher's point of view. She picked largely milestone issues. I mean, obviously, Batman's origin, Robin's origin. Um, from there, she moves on to um, stories that were extraordinarily successful for um, DC Comics, uh, a section of Return of the Dark Knight, The Killing Joke, um, and, and uh, an issue of Batman Year One. Um, and you know, I think you know, Frank Miller is represented twice. I think Doug Mensch is represented twice. Um, so yeah, I'd love to know what the twelfth one was, but she picked things that you know were milestones not only for DC Comics, but you know, uh, in, in a way, milestones, personal milestones of her own, as some of these things happened under her aegis or she caused to happen. Um, you know, you know, okaying, you know, she's the one who greenlit things like Return of the Dark Knight and Killing Joke and things like that. So um, yeah, it's not a list I would have picked, but you know. None of our lists are going to match. Anybody listening to me right now, if they were to make a list of the 12 greatest Batman stories, like they, they would, you know, our Venn diagrams would all be just separate circles. Uh, <laughs> intersecting never. So, and it, it all has to do with memory. I, I was pleased to see, though, that she included a Brave and the Bold uh, story. It's a uh, Batman and Green Arrow one, which is, you know, particularly a good one. Okay, Joseph Lewis. In a recent Ask Chuck Dixon, you said you didn't want to write a Robin ongoing series because there wasn't enough established for the location or supporting cast or other factors necessary for the ongoing. So you preferred to write a mini where you established those necessary elements before using them in an ongoing. I'd like to hear more about why it wouldn't work or just have the mini be the first arc of a new ongoing. And what was the start point for the ongoing? Just And, and was the start point of the ongoing just to be the second arc. As, as a consumer, one of the things that aggravates me about current comics from the big two are the constant ending of a volume starting on a new volume. It always seems like the reason it is being done is just to make another number one issue that will sell more because it has a number one on it. 
I'm interested in learning about why it makes sense from a storytelling point of view. Well, you know, when you're going to tell a story that you know is going to go on, hopefully, for years and years and years, you want to get it off on the right footing. And in the third Robin miniseries, Cry of the Huntress, I concentrated largely on the main story. And it was a story involving Robin and the Huntress and, you know, usual crime, action, detection, fighting on rooftops and all that jazz. Um, but my, as, a, as a minor subplot in it, I brought forward, you know, Tim Drake's friends at school. What was his particular relationship with his father? Uh, what were the mechanisms that allowed him to uh, hide his secret identity from his father, that, that allowed him excuses for uh, being absent? You know, all the things that a superhero with a secret identity has to deal with. So, so I got to establish all this and you know, give him a recurring girlfriend who was part of the original story of, of this, of the story of Cry of the Huntress. She was introduced as a, as a, uh, a part of the suspense element, part of the rising stakes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, um, so that we organically meet all these friends, establish locations, build a supporting cast and everything else. But it was it was a small part of a larger story, um, and when you're writing for when you're writing a story, you never want to let the reader know you're setting things up. You don't want things to seem like you're setting them up. So so I wanted to write a story that was primarily a crime action suspense story, but that was also doing double duty in in setting up the ongoing, but without the reader realizing it. And so a lot of the elements in Cry of the Huntress that, that end up building this new world for Robin, his, his new, or Tim Drake, um, a lot of it is kind of hidden under uh, the larger story. So the readers don't realize they're being set up. Because you know as a reader or a movie viewer or a TV viewer, you know when you're being set up. You know, when the lead character's daughter is uh, displayed as being an expert in gymnastics, you you, you know you, that that's going to play a part later. Uh, and, and we all hate that. We're all tired of that. So I wanted to sort of create an organic story where you didn't realize what I was doing. <laughs> you didn't realize, you know, what was behind a drywall, what was under the bricks. Uh, so that's the purpose. And then when we get to number one, of the Robin ongoing, all of these characters have already been introduced. I don't have to reintroduce them. I can get right into the first arc on that first story uh, because I had other supporting characters I wanted to bring in, Shotgun Smith and, and Sissy and characters like that. And so we've already got his high school pals, his relationship with his dad, the mechanisms that were always changing of how he hid his, hid his, hid his uh, you know, nocturnal adventures as Robin hid his association with Bruce Wayne and Batman, all these things are already laid out in the miniseries. And it was just, it was easier for me to do it that way. I thought it was more palatable for the reader that way. And so um, that's what we did. I mean, there was no way I wanted to go from uh, the second Robin miniseries, primarily a Joker story, um, and then just rush into a number one of an ongoing series where it all had to be built post that. I really wanted that that breathing room. And DC agreed with me. You know, I kept putting off the ongoing. And um, and I said, you know, I, I promised, hey, with the third miniseries, I will I will put all the stuff I think I need for an ongoing together. And and that's that's why I did the way I, the way I did it. There was no reason to rush. Robin's sales were solid, Batman's sales were solid. So we had the time where we didn't have um, we, we weren't hurried up in any way uh a rare uh element a rare um era in comics where our sales were strong enough to allow us to make creative decisions uh, that weren't necessarily based on sales or the threat of cancellation hey have you subscribed to this channel please subscribe if you have already subscribed thank you very much you're helping to build this channel i'm crawling toward ten thousand subscribers I'm almost there almost there all right david zwally with comics completely abandoning the comics code some decades ago do you think this has helped or hurt comics in a creative perspective 
Uh, yeah, I'm all for adult comics. I mean, I like a, underground comics. I've certainly written R-rated comics uh, myself, but I think generally, um, uh, I think we were better off with the comics code for the largest segment of comic book publishing. I don't think parents paid any attention to it anymore, but at least it gave us guidelines, and those guidelines evolved over time, allowing us to do things you know, in the later years that we couldn't do before because the people running the comics code realized the world had changed and our readership was a little older. But but I think in general, the comics code was good. You have a follow-up question in a twin spin. David, again, do you think when the comics code was in place, it actually increased creativity in the sense of finding workarounds for the code? I, I absolutely do. I think back when there was a haze office in Hollywood, when there was censorship before the rating system just opened the barn doors for any kind of, you know, perversity or levels of violence. I think there was a great deal of creativity to get around these things. I think, I think it's, it's um, ironic that in a, in, in a time where the, you know, they had rules like if a, if a man is seated on a bed next to a reclining woman, he has to keep one foot on the floor you know, things like that. Um, I think in those days, um, the, the, the movies were more mature, more adult than they would be later when anything went, when you could do any kind of material uh, without, with virtually no restriction. Um, I think things were, you know, um, obviously more clever. They had to work around the censorship office. They had to create material that was safe for anybody to watch. I mean, every movie was rated G, you know, uh, but they could find ways to deal with, you know, weighty uh, material. I mean, if you watch a movie like Philadelphia Story, uh, they're dealing with some really, really um, tough material in a way that if you were to deal with it more directly, if you were allowed to use the language they wanted to use, would have taken a lot away from it. It would have diminished the storyline. It would have diminished the characters. It would have just seemed tawdry instead of um, effective and cathartic and uh, meaningful. So I, I really do think that. And, you know, the other thing to remember with comics is I, I know we're all comic fans and we love these comics and we're adults, but they weren't created for us. These characters are created for children. And you have to remember that. And that's what the Commerce Code was put in place to guard against what would come later, which is the, the world of comics we live in today, where these characters have grown up with their audience. Uh, they've become more mature. And I'm using air quotes here because I don't think a lot of the stuff is more mature. I think it's far less mature. I think a lot of it is puerile and perverse. And, and like I said, I'm no prude. I've written R-rated comics. I've written comics you know, that you can't show, the, you know, you know, children under 16. Uh, so I've got no problem with that. I certainly have no problem with comics medium being a mature medium and capable of being a mature medium for adults. But I don't see a lot of the material. I don't see, um, you know, uh, no longer threatening to wash the writer's mouths out with soap as being necessarily a good thing. I I think that without the constraints, without the uh, the, the the guardrails, um, it's it's like um, it's like going to the bowling alley when they put those foam things in the gutters. You know, this is what's the point. You know, you're gonna get a strike every time. Um, it's not challenging. Um, I, I've always always I've I've never railed against the comics code, but I certainly wanted to slip things through. You know, Air Force jokes, not Air Force jokes necessarily, but Air Force concepts. I was never one of those guys that wanted to slip through, you know, dirty words or, or, or something like that just because, you know, I, to appeal to the, the uh, you know, nine-year-old in myself. Uh, I, you know, I, I was never trying to do that thing stuff, but you know, I wanted to put more adult, more mature things, but it was always, you know, over the kids' heads. I thought, I think the comics mainstream. Superhero comics should be written on two levels. Um, you know, one where, you know, a, a kid, a precocious 10-year-old can enjoy it, but also there's enough there for an adult to enjoy. You know, much like, you know, the first 10 Pixar movies. So there you go. And who wants to see an R-rated Pixar movie? Not me.
Ryan Howard, I recently finished reading Red Dragon, the first of Thomas Harris's Hannibal Lecter novels. While I enjoyed Harris's novel very much, I can't help but feel like I was reading the blueprint for the modern portrayal of Batman. The hero was disturbed by past experiences of violence that he couldn't overcome. His actions had a determined detrimental effect on the people closest to him. The villains were basically demons with some kind of pseudo-intellectual explanation for why they were evil that attempted to make the reader sympathetic to them instead of hating them. There was this lingering question that hung in the air over whether or not the hero was doing more harm than good in their pursuit of serial killers. Then there's Hannibal Lecter himself, who many modern writers basically put clown makeup on to create their darker and more menacing version of the Joker. What are your thoughts on Thomas Harris's Hannibal novels or their movie adaptations? Do you think modern writers are basically plagiarizing Harris when they try to write dark and gritty Batman stories? Well, I, I read, you know, I've read all of Harris's Hannibal novels. Um, I was very, very impressed by Red Dragon. It did not want to make me ape it or, or write anything like it, but I enjoyed it. Um, and I, I equally enjoyed Silence of the Lambs. I thought, um, the wheels kind of came off after Sansa of the Lambs because the fame, the expectations, and all the rest of it. And then uh, Harris fell into a trap that we see comic people falling into by following in the footsteps of material like this, which is how far do you go? How far can you go until you're just basically shocking the reader, you're shocking your audience, as opposed to intriguing them? I mean, both of these novels are uh, very, very engaging. Uh, they really draw you into the minds of the characters and all the rest of it. And it justifies the level of uh, violence and the level of depravity committed by the villains um, because the novels are so thoughtfully written. And, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it, it, it's had an enormous effect. But like I say, you know, even Harris was detrimentally affected by this shift into darkness that we see with the novels, I, and I do think they were an influence, but I think that a lot of the comic writers, particularly the influence of writers from England who weren't that enamored with superheroes uh, and tried to basically remold them, uh, deconstruct them. So, so you end up with, you know, um, a character like Joker and almost every other uh, superhero villain turned into um, versions of Hannibal Lecter. And once again, you know, especially in a form where, I mean, the Joker, you know, has decades and decades of stories uh, following the killing joke, which is really the first of those kind of, um, the first real sign that we see that the villains are going to be turned into um, perverse psychopaths, uh, as opposed to, you know, tricksters or, you know, mentally disturbed criminals or sociopaths. And so we, <coughs> Killing Joke is the first sign. And, and since then, we've had decades and decades and decades of writers trying to take Joker further and further down that path, trying to top what Alan Moore did, trying to make it more dark, <coughs> you know, more disturbing, uh, more graphic. And it, it reaches a level of absurdity. And uh, it's just not a place to go, but it's, it's, it's where we are now. And I, I wish we could turn the clock back to more um, sensible, reasonable, uh, more, um, if not kid-friendly, adolescent-friendly uh, comics material. But that, uh, that horse has left the barn, I'm afraid. And um, that's just the way it ends. Kane Door, when you are creating a character built to operate within a specific genre, let's say street level vigilante, I'm interested in what, if any, steps you take to stay out of certain situations, scenarios, and other details so you don't create one similar to any of the others, even though you, of course, have to include enough material so that the new character fully feels as though they fit squarely in the genre you'll be writing them in. Um, well, I mean, The Punisher, I wrote The Punisher for a long time, and I love The Punisher. He's still my favorite comic book character to write. Um, but yeah, there's a specific genre, I and mean, even The Punisher isn't original. He's, he's lifted wholesale from Mac Bolan, The Executioner, uh, uh, create, created by uh, Don Pendleton in a series of extraordinarily popular 
paperback books in the 70s, there's, there's, there is no um, daylight between Frank Castle and Mac Boland. They're almost exactly the same character. And although over time, uh, thanks to writers like Mike Barron, uh, the Punisher evolved to be more nuanced than Mac Boland, more interesting than Mac Boland, certainly more uh, mean and more abusive. And, you know, to me, more grounded in reality as a person, maybe not grounded in reality by the things he did, but grounded in reality as a character, as a person we could recognize and relate to, uh, as opposed to Mac Bolan, who's sort of a, you know, super Boy Scout kind of character. Um, uh, Frank Castle is, is more flawed. He's um, not a perfect man. Now, in working in the genre, and obviously I love the genre, uh, you know, I, to, to scratch my Punisher itch, itch I, I created this series of, of novels featuring Levon Cade. And Levon Cade is different from Frank Castle in a lot of ways. Uh, first, he's a country boy, he's from Alabama. Uh, he also runs afoul of the law in a way that I never wrote the Punisher to run afoul of the law. Um, as I've often said, the one thing I regretted not doing with the Punisher that Garth Ennis did was create a, um, a law enforcement foil uh, for the Punisher, a cop who's trying to find him and find out who he is and either arrest him or, you know, uh, well, arrest him, you know, bring the Punisher to justice uh, under the law. And I never did that. In, in, in the Levon books, he runs afoul of every uh, local county and federal law enforcement agencies, some international law enforcement agencies that you can imagine, and of course constantly has to find his way around that on his way to pursuing his brand of homegrown justice. The other big difference uh, for me is that um, uh, Levon has no sense of humor. Now, now, Frank Castle doesn't have a sense of humor either, but he says things that are funny. He doesn't mean them to be funny, but they're darkly funny. It's not Levon. If anything, Levon is far more direct in his actions, even than Frank Castle. But the other major difference between Levon Cade and Frank Castle is that Frank Castle has a daughter uh, that he cares very much about. And he also has um, other family. And he would like to be left alone. Uh, he'd like to live in his... Um, his house up the holler in, in Alabama and not be bothered by anybody. But of course that, that can't be possible because he's always out there making trouble for himself. Uh, so th there's a lot of differences and I kind of flip a lot of things on the head. The other thing that I strived hard to do in the Levon Cade novels is to not write the same story over and over and over again. So if you read any of the 12 books, uh, each one is very different than the last. They're the same in tone. They're the same in pacing. The characters are consistent, but I do uh, prison escape stories. I do war stories. I do diehard type stories. I do, um, you know, um, getaway type stories. And uh, I try to mix up the plot lines uh, so that you're not just reading the same thing over and over and over again. And also in the way that I ease Levon into these stories, he's in, in a lot of cases, in a lot of these novels, he is not actively out hunting criminals. It just seems like trouble finds him. Uh, and then there are some where he's actively out trying to, you know, put down some uh, nest of scumbags. Now, um, The Horseman, which is a, you know, grounded non-superhero mass vigilante character that I'm doing for the Ripperverse, uh, is, is very much different from Levon Cade and uh, Frank Castle. I don't want to go into any detail because we don't, we don't tease and we don't spoil in the Ripperverse, uh, but Horseman will be out this summer by me and Joe Bennett. And you'll see that I've kind of taken a lot of the tropes and cliches of the vigilante justice character and turned them on their head in this series uh, to create what uh, Joe and I think is an extraordinarily sympathetic character um, that you're really going to re relate to. He's very, very much different. Than, than Cade and Castle, but you still get all of the vigilante justice thrills. The, the bad guys, they pay in the house of pain with this guy, uh, but we try to do it and approach it in a way that exceeds your expectations. Christopher Cohen, now you got me interested in your thoughts about the rule Mark Grunwald enforced at Marvel that traveling back in time, that is, 
when characters did it, they were redirected to an alternate timeline, not to 616. While I liked that it led to Walter Simonson conceiving the wacky satire of the Time Variance Authority, do you feel it took away the stakes of time travel adventures? I personally thought so. Well, every, every guy that ends up, or gal, who ends up writing a, um, running a comic book company, they have their own rules. They have things they want to see. I mean, I mean, Jim Shooter got rid of the Savage Land because he just thought it was preposterous. Um, there are a bunch of other things. I mean, different, different publishers have different prejudices. When I worked at CrossGen, uh, Mark Alessi didn't like characters with facial hair. Uh, so you, you had to deal with those things. Grunewald had a lot of rules. Um, and a lot of those rules were, I think, why I didn't get to work in the Marvel mainstream. Because um, you would, you know, he dictated how stories would open. Stories had to open in a certain way. And I felt that that was really, really repetitive. Uh, did it work for sales? Did it work for bringing, it certainly worked to create an engaging opening for the reader. But, but there's only so many ways you can do that. There's so many times you can have, you know, open the story with Spider-Man breaking up an armored car robbery. There's so many X-Men stories that you can open in the danger room, you know, just to have that kind of an opening. Uh, his rules for opening was that as soon as possible in the story, you needed to see the characters solving a problem using their own specific powers. And I just couldn't write that way. I mean, over at DC, I was free to open the story any way I wanted as long as it was engaging. Uh, you didn't necessarily have to see Batman or Robin or Connor Hawk on the first few pages showing off all their skills as long as it was, it was engaging. Uh, and at, at Marvel, there were, there were rules. I mean, I remember, I, I have nothing against Mark. Extraordinarily talented guy, oversaw a number of the successful titles. I'm not going to say what he was doing was wrong. I'm just going to say that there were different approaches. His approach worked uh, for Marvel. It worked for the books he was on. Um, but, you know, I, you know, the one time that I ever heard from Mark Grunewald was when I wrote a story in which uh, a bunch of villains were acting together who had never acted together before. It was during the Acts of Vengeance uh, uh, event. And I had one villain making fun of another villain's name and powers. And Mark called me and said, we don't do that at Marvel. We don't diminish our characters. And I said, well, it's not me diminishing the character. I mean, these are bad guys and they're just, ball busting one another you know i thought it was funny i thought it fit the character i thought it portrayed the character doing the mocking as a bully and a brute and a, a, a bad or a bad guy for that bad, bad people acting in a bad way but he didn't see it that way and i had to rewrite the dialogue to take out the scenes of him mocking uh pace pot pete the trapster it was killer shrike in case you're uh, curious who was making fun of the trapster uh, so, you know, those are the kind of rules he had and you had to work around it. And, and, and like you say, Walt Simonson managed to find a way, an entertaining way, uh, to work around it. So, and we all have our own, you know, if, if you work in this area of superheroes and science fiction and fantasy and the rest, I mean, th I think we all have our internal time travel, um, rules. I certainly do. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> triple spin. Okay, Christopher, again, what do you think of the whole legacy character trope? Do you think it ended up getting out of hand in comics? It felt fitting for the Flash, especially Wally West with the whole passing of the baton, him becoming the definitive Flash for a long time. Also, Tim Drake. I love Tom Pyers. Our Man. I was never won over with Carol Danvers. Uh, in my opinion, Monica Rambeau, as Roger Stern's effort surpassed her. And even the original Marvel, Kyle Rayner, it really seemed to get out of hand after Ed Brubaker and Matt Fraction's Iron Fist run. I don't know that run. But yeah, I mean, the the reasoning at DC to replace the legacy characters with younger versions of them made absolute perfect sense for the market. Um, I don't know whose idea it was. I, I, I guess it was Paul Levitz working with some of the group editors. But it, it actually was ingenious because uh, here they had these legacy characters. You had Hal Jordan and Oliver Queen and Barry Allen. And at this point, 
um, they were decades old and they were created long before the generation of new readers coming in to read the titles. And um, so the idea was, was that they would create younger alter egos for these uh, legacy characters that would be the version for that new generation of readers adopting the, the books. Because remember at this time, comic book sales were rising, rising exponentially, reaching a lot of new readers that we'd never reached before. So the idea was, well, let's create new versions of the older heroes that they can adopt as their version of those heroes. Um, you know, much like, you know, my generation, Sean Connery is James Bond. In, in, in the next generation, it was Roger Moore, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so it, it was a really great idea, and it, and it worked out. I mean, sales were strong uh, for a long time. Because and, and then, you know, the whole... I, I'm not a big fan of the story of how they got rid of the original legacy characters. I always thought it would have been better if they simply, like, vanished. Or, you know, and then they could always reappear later and still be heroic, but they sort of diminished them. They sort of deconstructed them. Uh, even in the case of Oliver Queen, who I mean, I killed Oliver Queen, so I, I have to plead guilty. Um, you know, I sort of, you know, Oliver Queen kind of died as a chump. I mean, he, he didn't go evil. He didn't go nasty. He didn't kill anybody or go crazy, but he just, he, he was used by a woman, which was to me, you know, that's how Oliver Queen would die. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I mean, I was all for it. I thought I thought it was a good idea. You know, obviously to older fans, it was a sea change and a lot of them didn't like it. But, you know, back then we were still thinking about new readers. We were still thinking about growing the readership and, and bringing more uh, young readers in. And so, uh, you know, it had to be done. And I completely forgotten about Tom Pyre's run on Hour Man. Uh, I love that run. I look forward each month when the compacts came to reading the next issue. And uh, I'm going to go reread them. Um, I liked it so much, I bound, I had them bound into my own hardcover edition. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go back and reread them in the next few weeks and uh, let you know what I think. But I'm, I'm sure they'll still hold up because I remember enjoying them so much. Christopher coming again. Uh, knowing your favorite run was Kirby and Lee's Fantastic Four, did you ever get the sense that Jack presented the scene with Rama Tut and Doctor Doom in Annual Number Two to hint that they had decided to switch, swap places? Tut armoring up and returning to the 20th century as Doctor Doom, finally fulfilling his fantasy of participating in the superhero and supervillain shenanigans he fantasized about growing up in his future, and Victor continuing into the future and creating the identity of Kang the Conqueror. I personally think that would have been the utterly batshit fun idea that, than the revelation that Tut Kang was a Richards. Yeah, that's kind of lame. I didn't know they did that. Um, yeah, I mean, I was a huge Doctor Doom fan. And when I was a kid reading about Rama Tut and Kang, I, I, I kind of got the idea they were all the same person. And um, I, I, I kind of got the idea that, you know, Kirby was going, well, in later years I realized what the, what the real creative dynamism was between Kirby and Lee. I think Kirby was going for that. I think that's, and, and Lee kind of dropped the ball on it by not, by, you know, hinting around about it, but never really delivering on all those hints to, to uh, feed us a little bit more information, to engage us a little bit more. But, you know, yeah, I always thought that the, these three guys were all the same guy. And, um, and, and I kind of got lost in the shuffle, especially after uh, Kirby left for DC. And, you know, everything that he had done, everything he had set up over the first hundred issues of Fantastic Four was kind of um, just sort of either mined for whatever was convenient or, or conveniently forgotten. But boy, what a Marvel event that would have been to, um, to um, you know, bring that story together and show that, you know, that there was a real connection. Either all three of them were the same person or that one was a clone, or you know something, something that bring. It's a story that could still be told and still be a hell of a story. Uh, but yeah, when I was a kid, I used to you know play around with that idea in my head that um, through time travel, and we mentioned time travel in Marvel. Maybe, well, that's obviously the reason it wasn't done during Grunwald's um, ages. Dara O'Sullivan, 
You've mentioned time and again your love for Judge Dredd. The character appears in the weekly British comic 2000 AD, which is an anthology magazine where Dredd stories appear alongside strips featuring other characters. Have you read, do you read, any of these other stories? One of the most celebrated runs is Slaying the Horned God, which is basically analogous to Conan. It was written by Pat Mills, art by Simon Bisley, and is considered some of the best ever printed in the comic. Have you ever read the story or indeed any other 2000 AD strip? Yes, I, I subscribed to 2000 AD for years and years and years. I didn't just read Judge Dredd reprints here in the United States. I was reading the, the, the actual weekly newspaper years before it was ever uh, made available uh, in, in book form or comic form here in the United States. So there were a lot of 2000 AD series I really loved. One of my favorites was Flesh. Flesh was so obviously written for, you know, bloodthirsty nine-year-olds. <laughs> That's what's so great about it. Just the unapologetically gory and cynical and mean. And what flesh is, it's about, you know, in the dystopic future when there's a lack of protein, uh, there's a lack of food for people to eat, they send hunters uh, back into the past to hunt for prehistoric life forms and bring them back to be used for food. And uh, the series eventually evolved into my favorite run of all time where they create these enormous... Uh, ships that would um, gather sea life. So they were, you know, sucking up megalodons and ichthyosauruses and pleosauruses, you know, and they would draw them into this, um, you know, this, this fish butchery, this abattoir for sea life, you know, these massively huge animals and then, and then can them, you know, it was a, it was a fishing boat that would at the other end of the system, the, these things would end up in cans. And um, and like I said, just this hyper-violent, uh, you know, populated with like incredibly unlikable characters <laughs> constantly betraying each other. Uh, but, you know, it's just a really nasty series, which the nastier it got, the more fun it was. And I just love thinking of the fact that, you know, there were these, I mean, I would have loved this comic when I was a kid. It just, it, it, it would have pushed all my buttons. Slain, yeah, I'm very familiar with Slain, uh, written by Pat Mills. Uh, and Simon Bisley did great work on it. But to me, the best guy ever to work on it was Mick McMahon. And McMahon just went, as you can see here, just wild with the detail. Uh, I recently bought some Apex editions. Uh, I, if you're not familiar with them, they're these big, they're like the artist editions here in the United States. Uh, I bought Apex editions of uh, Dread by Bolland. And I bought two volumes by Mick McMahon. One was Judge Dredd, one is 2000 AD. And, and the 2000 AD one has most of his slain work reproduced from the originals. And uh, 2000 AD originals were huge. His books were enormous because they're reprinted, you know, same size as the originals. And uh, yeah, I really dug slain a lot. Halo Jones by Alan Moore and Ian Gibson, another favorite. I really dug this series. Uh, it was a, a, a lot of fun. Uh, I, I assume set in the Dread universe, although I don't think we see any judges. And uh, Strontium Dog, uh, Carlos Esquera, uh, you know, kind of the Jack Kirby of 2000 AD. And he was the first artist on Judge Dread, and um, you know, Trouble in a Dystopic Future, which was 2000 AD's thing, but it was a fun series. I don't remember a lot about the concepts behind it and everything else, but I remember the lead character is really cool. And I've read some recent crossovers between uh, Dread and Strontium Dog uh, that involve time travel. Uh, and, and Dread showing up in Strontium Dog's future, which apparently is, is, is further in the future than Mega City 1. In Mega City 1, all those things are gone in the world of uh, Strontium Dog. So yeah, I dug that 2000 AD stuff, still do. Ivan Magula. You eventually talk about cross-gen, how they didn't like to write in Victorian London that's not Victorian London, and that it would be easier if it was the actual London instead of a made-up London, alternate reality London. I'm, I'm editing here. On the other hand, you eventually talk about how funny is world, how fun is world building and how you did like creating Bloodhaven and some other stuff like fake cola companies or burger franchises. So what's the problem with cross-gen's fake world that had bothered you? or how the cross-gen world building was different from bat world building. I'm guessing there's something related to the sigil Uber story. Yeah, the, the problem with um, cross-gen 
at its very, very heart was that Mark Alessi, who ran the company, who owned the company, who was the boss, he put the Uber story above everything. That all of these books related to each other in an enormous, you know, galaxy, reality, spanning epic. He's a big fan of Isaac Asimov's foundation. and He wanted something that rich and deep and all the rest of it. The problem is it's hard to do in monthly format with multiple titles and make any sense of it or make the readers care. Um, there were reveals about the universe that we waited way too long to bring out. And, and you know, we did it because there was an outline. There was a timeline to tell us when to bring these things out. Um, you know, reveals and revelations about what was going on, and, and we, we didn't do it. And, you know, we weren't allowed. So um, I mostly ignored, I, I paid lip service to the Sigilverse, um, to the big story. And in my best-selling title, El Cazador, I ignored it entirely and set El Cazador on Earth. Um, and, and, and that, for me, was the big problem at CrossGen was um, that... Because these things have to happen, had to happen on different worlds, we, we create these amalgams, these alternate versions. So they come up with a Sherlock Holmes type story, but it can't be placed in London on Earth, I mean, Edwardian London on Earth. So they have to create this world with you know, made up uh, names and stuff like that. But, but for all intents and purposes, the look of it, the, everything about it was Edwardian London. Uh, there was no departures. The architecture, the dress, the technology, it was Edwardian London. Um, and, and same thing when I wanted to do Way of the Rat. I couldn't simply set Way of the Rat in medieval China. I had to make up a country. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, it was medieval China. And, and all the different nationalities and everything else were just as you would represent them on Earth. Uh, same thing for Brath set obviously in what was supposed to be uh, barbarians versus ancient Rome, but we couldn't call it ancient Rome. And that is the problem. That is not, not, not to use a play on words. Uh, the crux of the problem was, is that Mark Alessi saw us as an Uber story company, a saga company, um, and that would build readership. But what we were was a genre company. Readers began to know that if, if Tony Bedard and Mike Perkins are going to do a spy comic, it's going to be a spy comic all the way. It's going to be everything you'd want to see in a James Bond uh, type adventure. Um, and, but the problem is, because it couldn't be set on Earth, there couldn't be any like Cold War analogies. There couldn't be any references to anything you would actually relate to. So it all seemed contrived and made up and sort of pointless. Because... It, it's a it's a spy story, but it doesn't take place on our world. Um, same thing, you know, Way of the Rat, Brath, all these others. Now, for the fantasy titles, it was no problem because they're made up worlds to begin with. But for the for the but for the you know more reality based genre stories or more historically based genre stories, it proved to be a problem, which is a shame. Uh, we had a meeting, to, you know, just before the end just before everything started to fall apart. And um, Mark went around the table and asked us all what we felt CrossGen was. And unanimously, we said, we're a genre publisher. The readers have decided we are a genre publisher. Um, and, you know, they decided that we're a genre publisher. And so um, you have to do what the readers want. And it, 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 the shame of it was is that we wasted the, because Mark continued to not agree with us, he, he said we were not a genre publisher. Um, we were going to stick with the plan, which was costing us readers every month. Um, the, the real shame of it was is that we had built up a reputation as a genre publisher, that if we, like I said, if we, if we picked a genre, you know, private detective, horror, whatever, we were going to do it up right. The readers could trust that it was going to be an earnest attempt at the genre. It wasn't going to be tongue-in-cheek. It wasn't going to be a parody. We weren't going to half-ass it. We were really going to do it. I mean, I, I, you know, El Cazador is the best pirate comic you'll ever read, and I'm not just saying that because I worked on it. 
Uh, it's, it's an absolutely gorgeous book, and Steve and I worked very, very hard on it. It is a, it is a perfect pirate comic book. And um, so that's what readers began, began to expect from us. And uh, when we didn't deliver, when we kept going back to the Uber story, I think that's, you know, that's when the wheels came off. And we couldn't gain new readers because they didn't like the Uber story. They'd heard about the Uber story. As one of our marketing guys said, um, what most people know about CrossGen is they don't like CrossGen. And this is before they ever picked up a book. Uh, it's, it's a real pity because, you know, if nothing else, CrossGen changed the way American comic books looked. Uh, American comic books never looked as good in the production and color, all the rest of it, as they did before CrossGen came along. And we really changed the way. We really upped the game. We raised the bar. So that's the one cross-gen legacy. Now, Batman, Superman, the DC Universe, the conceit there is that it's not our world. It never was our world. And so cities have to be created. Um, a whole environments have to be created um, so that, you know, if, 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 if Superman punches a hole in the moon, he can do that. You know, it's not reflected in our world because it didn't happen. It, 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 by doing that with Superman and Batman, it, you create a world where anything can happen. And uh, you're totally free from the constraints of reality. Um, and, and, and that's important. And, and then adding all the details to make that world more alive. more. I mean, it is a Batman and Superman um, take place in a version of New York or a version of the world. Spider-Man takes place in a version of Manhattan. So it's, um, with the, the superhero thing, and the thing is it's consistent across the DCU, it's consistent across the Marvel Universe. Every book isn't set in a different reality. They're all set in a consistent, conjoined reality. Same thing with the Ripperverse, same things with, you know, um, you know, Valiant or any other company that has a shared universe of characters. Uh, it's consistent, and it's 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 the conceit of the superhero genre. Um, now, if Marvel and DC were to set, I mean, if Batman existed in one version of Earth and Superman existed in a completely different version of Earth, then you you see the problem. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a whole different thing, and it, you know, world building in the cross chain universe, particularly when we're doing historical stuff, was frustrating. Because you just couldn't call Caesar Caesar, and you couldn't call Rome Rome, and you couldn't call ancient Britain Britain, you couldn't call the Celts the Celts. You had to come up with all these phony made-up words. And generally, I just used alternate words from actual history rather than making up new ones, so that you know you could still read it as being set on Earth. <laughs> but you know, Mark caught a lot of them because he was classically educated, so he knew what I was doing. So anyway, <laughs> but you know. If you're going to have a shared universe with a shared group of characters all in it all the time, then, you know, you got to go with one consistent location. Yvonne McGill, again, watching some previous videos, I saw you commenting that using, that, that Marvel magazines used to have a different level of art because of the format, which is bigger, also in black and white. So the artist felt challenged to make more detailed work. I believe the fact that it was black and white also helped to it. Well, yeah, okay. That's what I just said. Sorry. <laughs> I anticipated you, Ivan. Uh, for regular comics, a normal production for an artist is something like one page a day, let's say the average. Uh, Savage Sword issue used to have 50-page stories, so that being said, how the heck did Gary Quapis keep up with their schedule in a 50-page monthly? Is he some kind of freak speedster artist? Does he have two heads and four arms? No, 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 he doesn't. But Gary um, is very fast. He's able to produce extraordinarily high quality work in a very brief amount of time. Uh, Gary visited my wife and I for a while. He stayed with us for a few days and he brought pages to do. And a lot of times we'd sit there during the day and he would sit at our kitchen table uh, inking pages and um, uh, talking to us, you know, just sort of visiting while he inked pages. And he was, he was pretty damn fast. His pencils were very loose because he knew he was going to be inking it. And so um, he did most of his work in the inks, but he was able to keep up and, and probably do two pages a day. Uh, uh, now, could he keep up that pace forever? No, 
no, nobody could. But remember, in his run, a lot of a lot of the times he was penciler and Ernie Chan was inker over him. And uh, so that Gary's, um, because Ernie Chan was a finisher as well as an inker, Gary's pencils didn't have to be that complete. Uh, so they were basically contour drawings or layout type drawings. And then Ernie would do his Ernie thing on it. So if you look across the, the run, um, and then we had other people in between. I mean, Jeff Fisher would and people like that would do issues as well. Larry, well, Larry, because I was handing in so many scripts and I was so many scripts ahead, he would have maybe 10 artists at one time working on issues. Uh, so, you know, that bought everybody time. Uh, Gary had plenty of time. He didn't necessarily have to finish 50 pages in a month. Um, and, and you know, neither did any of, any of the other artists uh, because, you know, uh, they might be allowed two months uh, or three months to work on an issue. And so that's, that's how all that worked out. Um, because I was, you know, because I was, uh, you know, a, a young stud running 110% on enthusiasm and just turning out, you know, a Conan script a week, month after month after month, uh, it got to the point where I was so far ahead, Larry told me to stop, <laughs> go work on something else for a while. Uh, but, you know, that's how we were able to schedule this stuff. And yes, Gary was very fast, but also me staying ahead and Ernie Chan's help uh, on, on a, you know, maybe half of the issues Gary did uh, sort of sped up his output. And if you want to see other work by Gary and me, probably most of you aren't aware of this, we, for seven years, did a weekly strip for EdgarRiceBurrows.com. That's ERB.com. Uh, seven years worth of full-color strips just like this of Pellucidar, David Innes, and Abner Perry, and Edgar Rice Burroughs' classic adventures set at the Earth's core. And uh, Gary... Um, Kills it every week here. And uh, we had an appearance by Tarzan, if you like Tarzan. And uh, check it out. Um, it, it's a very reasonable monthly subscription feed. And there's hundreds of strips there. But none of them run as long as our seven-year run on Pellucidar. So, and Gary's doing some awesome stuff here. Hey, 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 Twin Spin, if I'm, I used to call Punisher an anti-hero. You commonly refer to him as a slob hero. So that made me think on this definition, and I conclude that I prefer to call him a slob hero. So I trace my line at the purpose of the hero. Frank Castle does what he does because he believes in the right thing. To, it is the right thing to do. So he's a hero. Yeah, slob freaking shoot first and don't ask later because he's already dead hero, but a hero. On the other hand, the anti-hero is someone who eventually, for many times, does something good, but for all the wrong reasons, mostly for selfish reasons. To me, the anti-hero is a guy who breaks all the rules. He'll shoot somebody in the back. Uh, yeah, he's out. Um, you know, Man With No Name is a perfect example of an anti-hero. He's basically out. He has a profit motive. Uh, he's turning in people for bounty. Uh, and, you know, but in the heart of him, deep down inside, um, he has a, his own code of honor. Um, in the very first... No man with no name movie, Fistful of Dollars, uh, a woman asks him why he's helping her. There's nothing in it for him. He doesn't want the woman. Uh, saving her won't increase his bottom line. And um, he simply says there was a woman once. In other words, there's someone in the man with no name's past um, that he wasn't there for. And every once in a while, he's going to make up for that. And, and across the man with no name, trilogy we we never see him kill an innocent we never see him be cruel to anybody uh we never see him shooting anybody that, that wasn't trying to shoot him first or that didn't deserve it uh, even in good the bad and the ugly we show him perform an act of mercy uh blowing up the bridge to spare the lives of soldiers on both sides of the civil war is his act of mercy and of course his ultimate goal is that they all go away because they're interfering with his plans. But you get the real sense uh, in the scene that he has a great deal of sympathy for the, uh, the soldiers that are wounded and dying and, and everything else, and, and particularly has a sort of a wordless bond with the Union officer who ultimately uh, dies in that scene. 
Uh, so yeah, the anti-hero is, you know, he's a cold-hearted son of a bitch, except for every once in a while where he reveals his humanity. Otherwise, I mean, we wouldn't care about it. Uh, if, 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 if that were the case, that the, the Terminator in the Terminator movies would be the hero because he's just going around, you know, programmed to kill and he's killing, he's succeeding. He's a winner. Terminator's a winner and he should be the hero. But of course he's not because there's no humanity. There's nothing to relate to. Uh, you know, the slob hero to me is the guy who uh, is just doing the job, he's putting in the time. You know, uh, he's not out to impress anybody. He's not out to look good. He's anti-authority. So in that way, he is an anti-hero. Uh, he just doesn't give a damn. And uh, Bruce Willis, to me, Bruce Willis embodies like the perfect slob hero. But, you know, Bogart was a slob hero. You know, Mitchum was a slob hero. Um, you know, there's lots of guys in the past that, that did it well. Um, and, you know, you're right. The Punisher's a slob hero, but, you know, there's humanity underneath there. He's, he's doing what he thinks is right, but um, he's trying to fill that void, that, that hole in his heart, and trying to get, overcome that loss. He's very, very bad at grieving. It's like he won't allow himself to grieve. Just get over it. Well, you don't get over it. You don't get over it. You lose a loved one, you don't get over it. You, you learn to live with it. You learn to remember the good times. But all Frank can think about is that afternoon in Central Park. And that's what drives him. David Jordan, are there any comic book heroes, superpowered or not, that don't kill that you think should? For story purposes, of course, not because it would be cool or justified. To me, I think the Hulk absolutely should kill both intentionally and unintentionally. And that should be the biggest part of why Bruce Banner never wants to be the, let the monster out. In my mind, I always think a Hulk rampage has a lot of collateral deaths, even when the writer tries to unbelievably say otherwise. Yeah. Obviously, when the Hulk goes nuts and buildings are falling and bridges are collapsing and cars are flying through the air um, and you know, things are exploding and blowing up and you know, this horrible, horrific, almost nuclear weapon destruction that the Hulk usually generates, yes, obviously people are, are dying or would die in a normal situation. But you can't show that. You can't show that because, I mean, um, because there would be no reason for Bruce Banner to continue existing when he wasn't the Hulk. Um, the only sure way that Banner could, um, the, only, the only sure thing Banner could do <laughs> to prevent turning the Hulk would be to kill himself. And if he were responsible for the death of countless thousands of innocent civilians, um, you know, he would. Anybody would. You would do it. I would do it. If you, if you and I knew that there was some sort of uncontrollable psych psych psychotic rage we had no control over, that, that by force of nature or science or whatever, that they would reach a point where we would, you know, kill people, you know, the people we love, strangers we've never met, that we would be a force for, you know, totally chaotic destruction, um, we would kill ourselves. Who could live with that? Uh, so you kind of just have to avoid it. You kind of have to go along with it. Let's go back to the little kids in the superhero costumes. You know, you just got to think this is part of the fantasy. This is part of the conceit. You know, yeah, we want to see buildings falling down, but we don't want to see, you know, you know, rivers of blood flowing from the ruins. Um, I use this as an example, uh, the movie Fish Called Wanda, if you've ever seen it, there's a scene in which um, they're trying to kill this old woman. I, I can't remember exactly why. It's a comedy crime film. It's a caper movie. They're trying to kill this old woman. And in one of the scenes, uh, they try to drop a safe on her. She's out walking her little toy poodle. And the safe falls on the little toy poodle and crushes it. And we see a little little furry white leg sticking out from under the safe. In the in the first version they showed the test audiences, there was a little rivulet of blood coming from under the safe and, and down to the curb. And audiences didn't laugh. They didn't think that was funny. And so they reshot it without the blood, and it, it gets one of the biggest laughs in the movie. So there's there's a point at which we will acknowledge the fact that there has to be deaths but as long as you don't show them there's no effect as long as you don't show the you know the bloody horrible carnage that would obviously surround the hulk uh you can get away with it 
And once again, I remind you, these are characters created for children to read. So, you know, who wants to freak out a bunch of children? Unless they're your own. You can freak out your own kids. I mean, that's, what's the use of having them? <laughs> well, hey, one more thing. This is the trivial. This isn't really a story. It isn't an anecdote. It's just a mild passing interest. It's a memory I had. Doing this show for you folks and you people asking questions, you know, makes me think about my past career and things that happened when I was working at DC and Marvel. And, and this one just sort of popped into my head the other day. Uh, I remember the time when I ac DC accidentally sent me one of Alan Moore's royalty checks. <laughs> and I opened it and I'm like, that, that's not my name. Al Alan Moore. So I had to call, um, I guess it was Terry Cunningham who was managing editor at the time. I said, hey, um, there's been a mix up, you know, uh, I, I, I have a wrong check here. And so I, I sent it back to DC and they forwarded it to uh, Mr. Moore. And um, if you're curious, um, this was the 90s. Uh, he wasn't working, doing any work for DC at the time. Uh, I think he was on the outs with DC over Watchmen. And so the, the royalty check wasn't that big. It was three figures. Uh, I was making bigger royalty checks at the time. And I'm not bragging because Alan Moore, in the aggregate over time, made a whole, whole, whole lot more money out of DC than I did. But in that period, he wasn't he wasn't doing any work for them, and um, you know perhaps they were between new editions of Watchmen uh, and Killing Joke. Uh, but you know over time, I mean, eventually, I mean, when the first when the Watchmen movie came out, they they, they printed a, one million copies of Watchmen. Uh, so I'm absolutely certain that, that Mr. Moore was taken care of. Um, I know that he was taken care of to the point where he doesn't care about money anymore because he, he, he gave a lot of his money to Black Lives Matter. Uh, and only a person who doesn't care about money <laughs> would do that. <laughs> what do you say? He, he who steals my wallet steals trash. Okay, if you want to contact me with questions, suggestions, whatever, brunobookstore at gmail.com. Brunobookstore at gmail.com is the most reliable way to reach me. And you should try that out. And I will answer your questions right here. And if I can remind you, number 12 in the Levon Cade book series is out. Levon Scourge. Levon uh, is dealing with problems that have plagued him since the second book in the series. His family's in danger. And he's had it. He's going to take care of a business. And he travels to rural Mexico as well as the jungles of modern-day Vietnam to hunt down the people that are threatening his family in the way that only Levon can. Okay, that's it for me this week. I want to thank you for listening, watching, subscribing all the other wonderful things you do, and, and for the awesome questions. Absolutely fantastic in-depth questions this week. I appreciate every single one of them. Keep them coming, and I'll see all of you down the road.